Good morning. Greetings to all of you. You know, as we start our, our conversation the, this morning about, mm, excuse me, <clears throat> about the Bible, I probably need another sip of water just a second. <clears throat> I think back <clears throat> a few days ago about the funeral of Senator, Senator John McCain, who really represented the American nation and uh, even the secular media, as we looked at the news there, they talked about how he has selected the scriptures for his funeral, which was quite amazing. And it talked about how he was the man of the Bible, how he came to know and understand God's word when he was all the way in Vietnam as a POW with the other guys like him in solitary confinement for a few years, and then he joined them. And as he joined them, he started to recall, he started to remember the scriptures that he had learned when he was back in Sunday school. It's amazing how those stick with you, but you don't always realize how important they're for you until you reach a certain age, and that's exactly what happened with him. He has asked his captors for the Bible, but they refuse to give one to him because, well, you're not supposed to have one in a communist state, correct? And after all, if you're a POW, you're under their authority, so they tell you what to do. And yet he remembered so many scriptures, he was able to just quote them freely. And what happened was they've asked the other guys that were, the, the other POWs that were in captivity with him, they asked him to be there uh, their chaplain, <laughs> and he reluctantly agreed. He was an Episcopalian in his youth. Now when he came back to the United States, he joined the Baptist church where he's, his wife went. And in spite of the fact that he reached really high political heights, he was elected to Congress, I think it was in 1982 or 1986, if I'm not mistaken, sometime in the 80s, a long time ago if we look at it right now. And it, it, it's, a, it's at that time when, you know, you, you kind of want to forget about all of that that led you there, but that's not what he did. He was the man of honor, and all the way until the end of his life, he believed that the Bible was true, and the Bible carried this message that your sins can be forgiven if you come to the Lord with a sincere heart. And that's exactly the message that he not only carried in his heart, but also in his funeral. The story of God, that's how we are trying to title this message this morning that we're talking about. Another great man of God that lived a few centuries back was John Wesley. John Wesley, he, he was, uh, we can call a, him a believer from the very start of his life. This is 1700s, and we go back to Great Britain. Um, and John Wesley actually traveled to America but when, when it, was, it was just the original colonies here, even before the, the uh, Declaration of Independence. He preached in Georgia, and he preached what we might call the law. He didn't know the grace of God at that time, and he, his heart was, uh, was not fulfilled. He was... He was uh, just uh, uh, in this awe of the understanding of how wretched he is if he's not going to fulfill the law of God. And that's what his converts felt. Well, if you, if you can call them converts, that's what they felt as well, Indians mostly, and even the settlers that were here. And so he was so devastated, he, he bored a ship and he went back to, to the UK, to, to, to Great Britain. And it was there, they say, at that ship that he found, that he found some Moravians, Moravian brothers who were working on that ship. And they started talking with him about what the Bible was all about. Uh, you know, they said, do you have the testimony of the spirit that you're saved? And he didn't know what that was. And they, they showed him some scriptures from the same book that he honored. And he became truly the man of the book. And he said later on, when he got converted later on at a, actually a Moravian meeting there in London, he said, I am a creature of a day. I am a spirit come from God and returning to God. I want to know one thing, the way to heaven. And God himself has condescended to teach me the way. <clears throat> he has written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me that book, God. Let me be a man of one book. You might have heard a lot of Protestant Christians were called this way. They were called the 
people of the book. We, the Bible believers, are called the people of the book. And yet the Bible, even though we probably carry it with us, I hope you brought yours today, or whatever your Bible is today, Russian or English, I hope it's with you. Some of you may have electronic Bibles, that's okay too. But the idea is we, we carry it with us, and we probably, most of us that are here, especially from the Christian homes, have been fed the Bible with our mother's milk, right? It's, it's been with us all the time. So today I want to talk about what is so special about this book that is called the Bible. It is the world's bestseller. It is the world's best-selling book. You can find it in all kinds of uh, bookshops and electronic bookshops as well. And yet, in the same time, it's the world's most shoplifted book, believe it or not. It is still the world's most popular book because it is God's story, and it starts with God. In the beginning, God. These are the first words of the Bible. The Bible does contain a lot of history. We, we know about that, and yet we would like to think about the Bible as not just history, but it's his story. There's a lot of historical events that are part of world history, and yet they are omitted from the uh, pictures or from the uh, chapters and pages of the Bible. And uh, why is it so? Because God has chosen to reveal himself only through certain parts of what we might call sacred history. He chooses a nation that he actually creates himself, the Israelites, so that the Messiah could come on the world stage. And we Christians know that Messiah by the name of Jesus Christ. And that's why the Bible is so important, not just to read, but to study. And we might do well if we were to follow this advice as Ezra, the uh, um, the uh, biblical scribe back uh, about 600 years before Christ, he said, uh, it, it is said about him that Ezra has prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach it in Israel, that is the statutes and the judgments of God. The Bible is an amazing book because it's not actually a thin book. It's not the, the kind of book that you would expect uh, in a regular sense of the word. It is a library, and many of us are scared by even the sheer size of the Bible. It's over a thousand pages long, and uh, some of us may be scared to just even read the Bible through, even though some of us may have been disciplined enough to do that, and I commend you for that. And what we are finding is the Bible is um, can be divided into two parts. There's the Old Testament that's, that contains 39 books. There's the New Testament with 27 books. And there is, in all that diversity, there is amazing unity. And there is also amazing history to how the Bible came about. This is the modern look at the city of Biblos that uh, is found in Lebanon. And in the olden days, it used to be populated with a lot of these reeds that uh, sort of look like this. And these reeds were everywhere, and you could pick them up, and uh, uh, you can put them together, and you could roll them. This is how they did it in Egypt and other parts of the, of the world. And, and, and back in Lebanon and Levant, the, the ancient Middle East, they would put together these uh, leaves from the reeds and roll the stone of it on, upon them and just put them together into a papyrus. And that's where our world word for paper comes from. Uh, and they would call that Biblos, and Biblos in Greek would be one book, and Biblia would be books, just like in plural, and that's where our world, uh, where, where the Bible comes from. And the papyrus was one of the materials, uh, most popular material, because it was, it was not as expensive to produce. As you could see, you can just go pick up some of these plants, put them together, and there you, you have it. You, you've, you've got some of that material going on. And um, that material was used to produce a lot of the pages of the Bible as we know it. However, it is not well preserved. When we find these papyri today, not so much we, but the archaeologists, thank God for them. When they're finding these uh, papyri leaves, that's how most of the time they look like. And yet, in the same time as you look at this papyrus, it's hard for us to decipher something, but we've got people who are able to read this and they're able to tell us which gospel it comes from uh, and uh, what kind of writing was used at that time. And based on that, they can date uh, these papyri. We've got a lot of papyrus, but like I said, it's not a well-lasting material. There's another type of material that um, the Bible was well-preserved with, and most of the manuscripts that we have is in this type of material, which is called the parchment. And parchment is more lasting because it comes from calf skin. Now you have to 
literally kill, kill a lot of, uh, of sheep and lambs in order to produce this material. And yet in the same time, even though a whole herd of sheep would probably be needed in order to produce one Isaiah scroll, one scroll that would contain all of these over 60 chapters of the book of Isaiah. And yet uh, it is, they believed, it was wor well worth it because it contained the words of God himself. Uh, amazing history. And then we look also at how the Bible is composed. It's got three languages that it was written in, the Old Testament mostly in Hebrew and some parts in Aramaic. The uh, New Testament is in Greek. And then as we look at the authorship. We've got all these different authors that a lot of times have not had the acquaintance of each other. They didn't see each other. They didn't know about each other's existence. But the Lord has worked through each one of them to produce this great book. There's about 40 authors that we know of, and some of them have been the statesmen, like David or Daniel. And some of them didn't think about themselves in such a way. Remember Amos, and he's called to be a prophet, and he says, I am just a, um, a gatherer of fruit, or a shepherd, he calls himself that in a different place. Uh, men of all kinds of walks in life, and written, the Bible is written in different places. You've, you've got parts of it that are written in uh, um, like Egypt and the type, the, um, the land of Exodus and basically uh, that part of, uh, uh, of the world which we can even call Africa today. And there are of course parts of it that are written in Asia, uh, modern day Israel and ancient uh, Israel and Palestine and today's, uh, today's Europe, what we may call Europe as well. And these are the letters that are written to the churches in uh, various parts of uh, Europe, like the letter to Romans that is, is written to Rome. And the Bible has this amazing claim that it's got to itself that I'm sure all of you know, this is found in 2 Timothy chapter 3. It says, all scripture is inspired, and some translations have the literal word that is used in Greek there, and that is the breathed out. It is literally the breath of God, God's breath. It's not always pleasant when we sit by somebody and smell their breath because they haven't had a mint in the first place. Uh, but uh, that's what we're getting when we are reading this book and we're studying it. God's breath is pleasant. And he has breathed it in the way that he has found these men whom he has inspired with the spirit of God. Why has he done that? Again, the purposes are listed here so that we may have the reproof and the correction and teaching so that we could be perfect, so that we could train ourselves with the help of God into maturity because perfection has to do with maturity. And yet a lot of us, even though we read the Bible, I think what we're struggling with is we're finding that the Bible is difficult to understand. It's just difficult to understand, and the legitimate question is why? What are some of the reasons why the Bible is so difficult to understand? Well, guess what? There's a huge gap. A gap in culture, and gap in time, and gap in, in the languages that are used that is really not helping us unless we cross that gap. We need to know how to cross that gap. We need to, to be aware of it, first of all, have the tools and understanding in order to cross that gap. Well, think about some of these things. First of all, we probably have never lived in a nation that was ruled by a king. We, we just have never witnessed that. There are some nations around the world that have the absolute monarchy, but that's just not the, the, the majority of the powers out there. Yeah, we can call some of the democracies autocracies because there's this authoritarian figure up on top, and yet that is not quite the same as these ancient kings that had the absolute power, be it in Israel, Babylon, Assyria, or any other country that uh, was there during the time of the Bible. How about the animal sacrifices? We read uh, a lot about them. Uh, back in the uh, Old Testament, the whole five scrolls of Moses, the Torah, the law was written in order to, uh, to tell about that system, what sacrificial system is all about. And we know, we know that Jesus Christ is really the fulfillment of that system. <clears throat> and yet we have not seen probably one animal to be sacrificed unless some of us went <clears throat> to some of these missionary trips where we witnessed, uh, we witnessed all of that being done in an animistic culture. <clears throat> so that is very new to us probably. And something, even though we've read about it, we have not witnessed it. Means of transportation. A lot of us have cars back then. 
No cars at all, donkeys and horses. How about the houses? We probably don't live in this type of house that the ancient Israelites had, and it was the house that uh, was not so much of brick, but of mud and straw, and that's not the type of houses that we lived in. And captivity, even though we, most of us, have come from various countries, and we find ourselves in exile here, and emigration, but that's not the, the, the way we would describe ourselves. It has become our home. And yet we are reading about Babylonian captivity and other types of uh, uh, punishments that God has inflicted even upon his people and they have, have really suffered from it. So these are the types of experiences that we have not had and we can't quite identify with a lot of these things that are written in the Bible. And that creates that gap. Think about the language gap as well. We can hardly read the Hebrew script that is from right to left, but even Greek where the you know, Russian and the Cyrillic alphabets come from is difficult for us to read and understand. So all of that adds to the gap and adds to, the, to, 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 the, uh, to this difficulty that we have in understanding and even applying the Bible today. You can only apply it when you understand it, when you correctly interpret it, and when you don't quite have that understanding, when there's all these gaps in front of you, it is, it is quite difficult. And yet, in spite of all of this, the Bible has an amazing unity in its content. Forty authors that have hardly seen each other, that have not even known each other, a compilation of books that has one spirit and one message behind it. And it tells us that our main problem is sin, that uh, the cure for that problem is salvation through one person, Jesus Christ, and for one purpose, to glorify God. The message of the Bible can be summarized in the following way. way. First of all, it talks about the fact that we are of God's image. We're his descendants. We're his creatures. The creation, that's where it starts. That's where our origin is. But then there's a problem that comes into this world, and that is the problem of sin. God's, God sends a promise to this world. He says, I am going to send a Messiah. I'm going to fix that problem. I've got my way of fixing that problem, and that is through the Messiah that is going to come, through Jesus Christ. And all the way through the Old Testament, you've got the struggle between God on the one hand, and even his people, and Satan on the other hand, who really don't want to cooperate with him on this. And yet the Messiah does come. He does shed his blood in the church, and that's where we live right there in that part, is the carrier of that message all the way until restoration and consummation. That's when we are all going to be in the new heaven and the new earth. All of that is great, you would say, and yet, can the Bible be trusted? That's what a lot of skeptical people say. Maybe you could, could be one of them. You could have some doubts about the biblical authorship or authenticity. And if you don't, you probably have uh, met people out there in the secular culture who have had questions about um, whether we can trust the Bible. How can we know, in other words, that this is not just a compilation uh, that has been adopted by churches and men who liked it? and has not been concocted in some mind. Well, let's look at some of the evidences. There used to be a historian who lived uh, in the middle of uh, uh, the 20th century in Great Britain, and his name was Steve Sanders. And in 1952, he came up with these three tests. He said, in order for us to know that the document is authentic, in order for us to uh, establish its authenticity, it has to pass certain tests. And these are the kinds of tests that he has proposed. One, he says, the internal test. That is, what is the document claiming to say about itself? Secondly, he says, there's got to be external test. What are some of the other people externally saying about it? And thirdly, there is the bibliographical test. What are the sources? What do we know? Or how many copies uh, are there about that document? And you know what? The New Testament and the Old Testament all together, the Bible as we know it, passes it with flying colors. I'll give you just a, a gist of what we know. Well, first of all, there's the testimony of the scribes. Of course, when we open the Bible, several thousands of times the prophets are claiming, thus says the Lord. That is a claim, not only of the prophets of the Old Testament, but also of the writers of the New Testament. And some of these verses that you have probably known from childhood and have heard in Sunday school, that's what they are saying. And yet, I'm using the word claiming, meaning this is 
only a saying without proof. And yet it is important. So the Bible does claim itself to be the word of God, and yet it may not be enough for some of us because it's like circular reasoning. Well, how do you know the Bible is the word of God? Well, because it claims to be so. And how do you know if those claims are true? Well, because they're in the Bible. And uh, how do you know? And, you know, it's, uh, it's back and forth. So <clears throat> these are some of the claims. Uh, the scripture is God-breathed in 2 Timothy 3.16. Uh, Peter says that uh, we have learned these things not from ourselves, but the Spirit of God has revealed this for us. Let us dig deeper. Let us see what are some of the other things that tell us that we've got the original text of Scripture with us. Not the originals themselves. that have not, They have not been preserved. But we've got a huge number of copies, over 5,000 of copies of the manuscripts of the New Testament alone. If you compare this to any other ancient writing, be it uh, the uh, ancient poems of uh, Greece, like Homer's poetry, of ancient Greece or Tacitus history or annals. Those are some of the uh, works that we base our understanding of the ancient history today. So if you are learning at uh, school or university, if you're learning about the ancient history, those are the works that the modern textbooks are based off. We just don't have any other sources. And yet those works have for anywhere from six to 10 copies. We've got over 5,000 of copies of the New Testament. That's a huge textual evidence. In the same times, those works, be it literally or historic, the secular works, usually have a span of time or gap of time that, uh, that has, uh, that has uh, elapsed from the time they were written that is huge, anywhere from 900 to 1,000 years. And uh, literally anything could have crept into those sources during that period of time. Think about what could have happened in about 1,000 years. And yet, you will never see anybody questioning Tacitus or Homer or any of these ancient writers. You would never say, oh, wait a second, we don't really know if what they wrote is true or authentic. And how come when we've got this little gap, anywhere from 25 to 125 years, and sometimes even down to 10 years, there are some manuscripts or parts of the Bible, be it the Gospel of John, for example, or the Gospel of Matthew. There was uh, a little piece of parchment that was found uh, recently in uh, one of the desert there in, in, in Egypt. And uh, it contained parts of the Gospel of Matthew, and they dated it just... Uh, just about 90 to 100 AD, which, uh, which is really close to the, to the date of original. It could have been 10 to 15 years to the original, very close. If that's the case, then, uh, and, and if, that, if, if the, the testimony of these scribes and the scrolls was not true, and these scrolls were available in such wide circulation and, and in such short span of time, think about the evidence that it brings and the eyewitnesses who lived in the same time who could have stood up and said if any of that stuff was wrong or not true they could have testified towards that and we don't see and we don't hear any of those testimonies and plus there's a huge accuracy in these manuscripts a lot of people make huge deal about well there are discrepancies and there are some of these errors in the bible these errors are copyists errors there are very minimal to the content of, of the Bible. You know, some letters being misplaced and so forth where the message is not corrupt at all. 99.9% .9 is, is correct and verifiable. And when you go to these other ancient writings, some of them are known by 60% or 70% or perhaps 80% accuracy, which means about 20 or so percent is questionable in their content. But there's more. There's the testimony of the stones. And if you, if you look at archaeology, well, a lot of people would say, prove to me exactly that the Bible is true by the archaeology. There's two statements that we can make. First of all, no archaeological find has ever disproved the Bible. And secondly, thousands of archaeological finds support the Bible. The first means that even though we cannot go back and exactly find the original manuscripts, yet there are no finds that have disproved directly what the Bible says. 
and hundreds of them actually support the biblical evidence. Here's a few that you can find in today's museums if you travel to them. This one is in one of the European museums. I forgot whether this is at uh, British Museum or Louvre or Pergamon, but it's, it's one of those. This is the Stone of Cyrus. Uh, a lot of times the historical people, the historians have questioned, the secular historians have, have uh, questioned the decrees that were issued by first Cyrus and then Darius. Remember the decrees about the 70 years captivity that are spoken of in the Bible, in the, book of, in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah that allow the Israeli people to go back and resettle in their land. And those were questioned until, until this was found. <laughs> and this was a copy, and that's how they copied the laws in that time, and they distributed them in cylinders, these circular things. And, and the Persian kings would send these cylinders all around the empire so that these writings, these cylinders, could be read then by the heralds and announced on the streets and squares and plazas of each city so that all the people, all the citizens could be familiar with its content. And that is what is found in one of those cities and now it's on display and it exactly cites the same text as in your and my Bible and it is in Aramaic writing. This one um, is called the Black Obelisk and it contains the name of one of the Jewish kings, actually an Israeli king. Remember, there was the division between Judah and Israel, the southern kingdom and northern kingdom. And Israel became the northern kingdom and southern kingdom was Judah. There were a few good kings in Judah. Were there any good kings in Israel? Anybody who knows? Good kings in Israel. There was one whom, uh, who at least started on a, on a good foot and his name was Jehu. Remember that? Elisha was given uh, from God the command to go ahead and anoint Jehu. Jehu was the military commander. And Jehu goes ahead and kills the king that was before him and kills his, his, uh, his lineage as well because there was so much against the Lord. There were, there were wicked. And he institutes and reinstitutes the worship of the true God, Yahweh, the Lord. And this is in Israel where, as you know, the Israel has stepped away from God before Judah did. So what we can see here is Jehu bringing, and you can, you can kind of see that on, on that piece over there, the king Jehu is bringing to Shalmaneser, who was the king of Assyria at that time, his tribute. He, he had to do that because Israel was one of the weaker nations. Now, you can still say he shouldn't have done that and actually trusted in the Lord. And I would probably agree with you because it's not like Jehu was one of these kings that would completely like David was. That was not the case. And yet, at least in the beginning of his reign, he did resemble the obedience to God. His name... Jehu is on this black obelisk that you can find in British, British Museum today. This is a recent historical find, the House of David. That's what in Hebrew is written on, on these stones and on these pieces. Um, the Hittites, where the, the nation, when, when Abraham is trying to find a, a cave for his deceased wife, and he goes around and the Bible in the 18th chapter of uh, Genesis records his negotiations with the, with the Hittites. And a lot of historians have questioned that. And they said, no, Hittites have never existed, not in that time. Until in the modern day Turkey, which is Asia Minor, back in the beginning of the 20th century, actually in 1915, in, in that year, they have discovered their capital. They have unearthed, and these are the remains of their entire capital, and all that culture was verified to exist. And time and time again, the Bible proved to be true. And there are still some discoveries that are probably still awaiting uh, their turn. This is a, uh, a stone plaque that was found in Caesarea. Caesarea was built by Herod the Great on the banks of the Mediterranean over in ancient Israel. And what we see here is the confirmation of the fact that Pontius Pilate was the ruler of Judea at that time. His name is on that plaque. Until then, the historians were even questioning that. So again, there's the testimony of the scrolls, the scribes, the stones, 
How about the supernatural predictions? What are those? Those are not just the miracles, but also if you know something is going to happen beforehand and if you know about it hundreds and hundreds of years before it happens. And the Bible contains many of those and they are called prophecies. They are absolutely amazing if you look at them. And probably the most amazing prophecy is how the Bible describes the coming of Jesus Christ. As you look at this, and it kind of gives you this idea of the bull's eye, hundreds of years before Jesus came, the prophets knew not only where he would come from, what tribe he would come from, what family he would come from, uh, what type of a person he would be, what how he's going to to be brought about on this earth, what kind of death he is going to die, and the timing of his death. All of that is in these prophecies. It's the same thing as you were to travel today to a distant city where you've never been, come to a street at a certain point to an intersection and find a bench there. And there would be a person there at that exact time with the exact characteristics that you would be looking for. That's how exact this is. This is amazing. There's other supernatural confirmations that the Bible has. And that is the miracles. Why the miracles are there? Not only to show that God is so great and powerful, but also to confirm the message. Jesus didn't come to heal all the sick. Jesus, Jesus didn't come to feed all who were hungry. That was not his mission. And that's what he underscores. A lot of times he would say, don't come to me for the miracles, but listen to the message of the miracles. Remember in John 6, there are people who flock after Jesus even as he walks over water of the Sea of Galilee to the other side. Well, they get on boats and they actually heard after him. And he says, you're not seeking me because you've seen these miracles. You have not really understood their meaning, but you want more bread. That's what you want. You were fed. You really liked it. You would like to get a king who is going to feed you all the time. So these supernatural uh, con confirmations are there to underscore the message of the Bible. And guess what? The other books, as we compare them, even the Quran, for example, that Muslims hold to be the holy book, well, here's a quote where basically uh, Allah, be it the true God or not, we don't think he is, and yet, uh, according to this book, he says, they're not going to listen to you. You are not really producing any miracles as the former messengers have. Amazing but true, Muhammad, Muhammad never produced a miracle or claimed to produce one. Jesus did. Finally, let's look around ourselves and into our hearts, the testimony of the Spirit. The Bible says that when we become children of God, we can understand there is the inner witness of the Spirit that tells us that this is not a simple book. And this has been confirmed. This is an experiential confirmation, of course. And only those who have had that experience can testify to it. And yet it is true for those who have experienced it. The testimony of the Spirit is there. And that testimony is in those who are saved. Be they noble, like uh, Chuck Colson over here, one of the statesmen of the, the statesmen of the former days here in the United States, or some of these tribes like the Yamamoto Indians over there who uh, seems like they're still living in the ancient times. Whoever comes in contact with the Bible gets changed and they receive this testimony of their lives inside of them. And today, the question that I'd like to pose before all of us is, what are you going to do with that testimony? Is the Bible going to remain for you one of those ancient bestsellers that is still honored and yet is the product of men, or is it the word of God? The question is before all of us today, folks. We need to decide, and then the decision is whether we're going to just honor it as a literary masterpiece or we're going to listen to it. We're going to fashion our lives in accordance with it. We're going to obey its message because the Bible can truly be trusted. And may God bless you as you discover its gems and treasures. Amen. Thank you.